Morning, everybody. Good to see you all. If you have the Bible with you, we'll be in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Our reading will be verse 13 through verse 18. We're going to finish off the last of chapter 3. And we've been working our way through the book of James, the overriding idea being pure religion, and that that is uh, maintained by good works and different things. We noticed in chapter 1, the priority and the focus in chapter 1 being on wholeness or Christian maturity and different things that we learn about in chapter 1 that bring about wholeness in the life of the Christian, Christian maturity, a a wholeness of Christian virtues, a growth as there ought to be in the life of a Christian. We learn about that in chapter 1. And then chapter 2, we we focused in on works and that uh, we're saved unto good works. Then chapter 3, we've been focusing on words and Last Sunday, was it, was, it, was it Wednesday night? Last Wednesday night, we focused on words, the wonder of words, and that was the first 12 verses of James chapter 3. And then today, verse 13 through verse 18 of James chapter 3, we're going to have a look at the ways of wisdom. And so, we, if you want to break down James chapter 3, Verse 1 through verse 12 is words. Verse 13 through verse 18 is wisdom. Help you think your way through. That's one good reason to outline passages of Scripture and outline a a book uh, is because it helps you think your way through. Uh, Even if you don't have your Bible and you're needing to answer somebody or you have a question of your own, you can kind of think your way through and you can work your way through, well, it's this, 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 well, it's probably about here and you can at least get yourself close and uh, as you work your way through. So ways of wisdom this morning, let's pray and then we'll uh, read our passage and we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, uh, for the time we have together, thankful for those that are here with us in person, thankful for those that are watching online and Lord, we ask you to bless, help us, we pray, Lord, I need your help. And uh, Lord, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. James chapter 3 and verse 13. Who is a wise man and endured with knowledge among you? That's a question. Who is a wise man and endured with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not. And lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. There's a question asked in verse 13, who is a wise man and endured with knowledge? And it seems to link back to verse 1. James chapter 3 and verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Verse 1 is an exhortation not, for, for not to throw yourself into being a master of the Scripture, not to promote yourself and not to uh, be too hasty about being a teacher and a master of the Scriptures. And because he says in verse 2 that there's a, a greater... Uh, the end of verse 1, because there's a greater judgment, and verse 2, there's a lot of offence can be brought about in verse 2. And then he spends the whole rest of the passage down through verse 12 on words. And that's what 
If you're going to be a master of the scriptures, and in the context here, that's a, a teacher of the scriptures, you're going, to have to lo- you're going to have to use a lot of words. And you're going to have to use more words than the average Christian. And you're going to be held to a higher standard and a higher account. And so then he kind of gets through talking about words and the, the blessings of words and the danger of words. And we, we learn about both sides of words on Wednesday night. And he gets to the end of talking about words and then he, he jumps into asking a question, who is a wise man and endured with knowledge among you? So this seems to be a, uh, what you might call a, a qualification, I guess is a good word. Spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, uh, are perhaps given here as needed qualities if you're going to be a teacher of the scriptures and you're going to be a, a master of the word as reference to verse 1. It says here, uh, endured with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. So in verse 13, you have two words. You've got knowledge and you've got wisdom. Let me give you a definition of, the, of both of them. And there's so many different definitions, but let me give you these ones. I like these ones. Wisdom. We're talking about biblical wisdom. We're talking about Bible wisdom as a Christian. In this context, wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. To have biblical wisdom is to see life from God's point of view. And then knowledge is living life from God's point of view. There's there's one thing to see life from God's point of view, then it takes knowledge to take that wisdom, to apply it to life, to live life according to God's view. Intellect, biblical wisdom and biblical knowledge has nothing to do with intellect, IQ or education. Absolutely nothing to do with it. That's something completely different. You can have low IQ as far as this world is concerned, but have great biblical wisdom. Biblical wisdom has nothing to do with IQ, intellect and education. Let me just give you four things about spiritual wisdom and I'll give you some references, just some introductory thoughts and then we'll get into the meat of the message. Spiritual wisdom is to have God-given ability and skill at godly living. Let me repeat that. Spiritual wisdom is to have God-given ability and skill at godly living. Living life in the light of God and his precepts and his principle. It takes biblical wisdom to live life in the light of God and who he is and in light of his principles and his precepts. Matthew 7 and verse 24, Therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. It's a wise individual that takes the principles of God and the precepts of God and applies them to their life. It takes biblical wisdom. It takes ability and skill. Okay, second thing in regards to spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom is available to all. James chapter 1 and verse 15, notice it. Just jump back there, James chapter 1 and verse 15. Uh, verse 5, sorry. I keep doing that. I don't even have that written down. I have, I have the verse 5 written down. But in my mind, and as I've been studying this for the last week, I keep saying verse 15. Can't get it out of my head. James 1 and verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You lack spiritual wisdom... It is available to you this morning. You can have it if you want it. You can have, it's there for the asking. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 5 simply says, get wisdom. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. If, if wisdom was not available, God wouldn't tell you in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 5 to get wisdom. And then Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So, 
spiritual wisdom is available to you. Third thing, spiritual wisdom begins with the fear of God. Uh, it's, that's a principal thing. It's the very basics of wisdom. Uh, you, have, you can't even start down the road of progress in biblical wisdom if you have no biblical fear of God. Psalm 111 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end of wisdom. It's not halfway down the road of wisdom. It's just the very beginning. It's the very principal thing. And you can't get any further down the road until you learn to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then another thing in regards to spiritual wisdom, spiritual wisdom, when applied to your life, will bring you happiness in life. Proverbs 3 and verse 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. You're not happy? You may need some wisdom. And then take that biblical skill and that biblical ability and the biblical precepts and the biblical principles, apply it to your life, put it in action, and you'll find some joy and some happiness coming in your spiritual life. Notice verse 13 also says, uh, Who is a wise man, endured with knowledge among you? Let him, notice this statement, Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. James is saying, You say you have wisdom? This sounds familiar, doesn't it? We looked at it in chapter 2. You say you have wisdom? Show me your wisdom. Out of a good conversation with meekness of wisdom. It's very similar to James chapter 2 and verse 18. Notice it. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith. That's what he said. He said, show me thy faith. And now here in chapter 3 and verse 13, show me your wisdom. Show me wisdom out of a good conversation. Show me that wisdom uh, with meekness of wisdom. So... Uh, just as faith ought to be put on display and can be seen, biblical wisdom ought to be put on display and can be seen when it's been lived out. Luke chapter 7 and verse 35 uh, says this, But wisdom is justified of all her children. Wisdom, when it's put on display... Wisdom is recognized, wisdom is honored, and wisdom is acknowledged by her children, by those that have it. Wisdom is justified of her children. And when you have biblical wisdom, you can see biblical wisdom being applied in the lives of others. All right, just some introductory thoughts. Now let's get into the meat of it here this morning. Let's get into verse... Let's see. I want you to notice, if you would please, first of all, verse 14 through verse 16, point number one, polluted wisdom. Here in this passage, we, we are presented with two types of wisdom. There's polluted wisdom and there's pure wisdom. And we will, first of all, examine pure, uh, polluted wisdom. I'd like you to notice the origin of polluted wisdom. Notice it in verse 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. The origin of polluted wisdom. What's the origin? Well, it descendeth not from above. Didn't come from heaven. And if it didn't come from heaven, it's not good. So it, it, its, its origin is from below heaven. At the very least, it's from this world and even from below this world. And we'll look at that as we work our way through. Uh, we know it's not, if it, if it descendeth not from above, we know it's not good because of James chapter 1 and verse 17. Have a look back there in James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? 
is from above. So if, if it's good and perfect, it's from above. This wisdom is not from above. So it's neither good nor is it perfect. If it's not from above, we know it's not from the Father. And it's not from the Father of lights. Therefore, we know it's not good and it's not perfect. First of all, notice three, three things that it is. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is. Three things that this polluted wisdom is. Number one, it's earthly. That means it's of this world. That kind of wisdom embraces humanism and rationalism. And humanism and rationalism is opposed to biblical wisdom. Because biblical wisdom quite often flies in the face of humanism and rationalism. Well, a lot of biblical wisdom is not very rational. Well, that doesn't make sense. A lot of biblical wisdom doesn't because it comes from a different economy. It comes from a different world. It comes from a different perspective. And so it's earthly. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 19, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So it's, it's earthly. That speaks of the world. It's sensual. It's not from above, but is sensual. That speaks of the flesh. It's natural, passion, self-gratification. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 4. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Your own wisdom is sensual wisdom. It's not necessarily humanism and rationalism, but your own wisdom is dictated by your passions. It's dictated by your mood. It's dictated by your feelings. It's fleshly. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Then listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you would. So this polluted wisdom is earthly, it's sensual, and then thirdly, it's devilish. And that's the only time in your King James Bible you'll find that word devilish. It's not used anywhere else. Uh, so this wisdom is from the devil. It is satanic. It's demonic. It's reprobate. It's not necessarily inspired and energized by humanism and rationalism or by your passions or by your flesh or your own wisdom, but it's energized and inspired and maintained by satanic influences. And I, I would say we can see that in our day. The wisdom that's been applies, applied to some things in government and in our world, it's, it's, not, it's gone beyond rationalism and humanism. It's gone beyond just the wisdom of men. It's it's devilish wisdom. It's demonic wisdom. When when men are dressing like women and women dressing like men and all this kind of perversion that's going on and they want to carry on about the the, the wisdom that that is and how good that is and what it's going to... It's devilish stuff. That's energised from the pits of hell. John chapter 8 and verse 44 says ye of your father the devil and the lusts of your father ye will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it this polluted wisdom is not from above it's three things earthly sensual and devilish the world, the flesh, and the devil. Our three great enemies. 
as Christians. Earthly, sensual, devilish. The world, the flesh, the devil. Be mindful of that. None of this kind of wisdom originates from heaven and the father of lights. Let's notice not only its origin, but let's notice the outworking of this kind of wisdom. Go back with me to verse 14. But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth, this wisdom, that, that which is mentioned in verse 14, this wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every, and every evil work. So let's notice the outworking. We'll notice it in verse 14 and verse 16. The word bitterness, but if you have bitter envying, the word bitter, it means sharpness or a piercing, abiding, it's acrid. Bitter, sharp, piercing, biting, acrid envy. It's not just envy, <laughs> it's, it's accelerated envy. It's, it's, uh, it's hot envy. It's bitter envy. It's sharp envy. That word envy uh, speaks of jealousy, malice. It's the unease. And this is where it applies to you. Listen to this now. The unease or repining at the prosperity and success of another. It's discontent or covetous for another's position or possessions. You say, well, I'm never, I'm never envious. I think you just lied. We all struggle with that at different times. We, we all feel that unease when someone gets that promotion that we wanted. We all feel that sinking feeling when someone gets asked to be the Sunday school teacher and I don't, when someone gets asked to pray and I don't, or someone gets asked to teach and, or preach and I don't, or someone, that happens even in the church body, there's envy can, can creep in, well how come pastor asked him and didn't, I, how come pastor asked her and didn't ask me, and instead of saying well praise God they get an opportunity, you see that that's the, the wisdom when you, when you become envious at somebody else because of not only their possessions but perhaps their position or what they get to do or the honour they're given or what, whatever it may be, when you feel that envy rising up and that unease or that repining, well, oh, woe is me, suck my thumb. That, that's not heavenly wisdom. That, that's earthly wisdom. That's sensual wisdom. And if you let it go, it can become devilish wisdom. That's envy. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 30. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy, the rottenness of the bones. You see, envy, envy is going to destroy you. It doesn't, it doesn't destroy the other people. They don't even know you're envious half the time. It rots you from the inside out unless you repent of it. Unless you acknowledge, boy, that's, that's not heavenly wisdom. I'm not applying wisdom to this situation. Not the wisdom I need to be. I need to repent of that and I need to embrace some pure wisdom, not polluted wisdom. But how quick it is for us to gravitate towards this polluted wisdom. You see, we, when I say the word polluted wisdom, you might think, well... I'm probably not guilty of that. We're all guilty of it on a daily basis. Amen. We are. We apply this polluted wisdom all the time. As we, as we navigate our marriage, as we navigate our children, as we navigate work, as we navigate church, all these different relationships, we have all these different opportunities on a daily basis to apply some kind of wisdom. And you get to either apply polluted wisdom or pure wisdom. And envy, uh, that's, that's, that's the outworking of this polluted wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife, strife. 
Strife speaks of, <clears throat> of factions or contests, self-promotion, contention for superiority, striving and ambition to be number one. There is no, there's no place for that in the life of the Christian. There's no place for that in uh, the life of the local church. To create and energise factions and strife between groups or between peoples or personalities. That, that's, that's not heavenly wisdom being applied. That's earthly, sensual, devilish. And we need to be careful that we repent of that kind of thing and that we, when, when there is strife and we sense strife either in our own heart or in a, in a situation, we need to acknowledge that that's, that's not heavenly wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife, and notice this word, I want you to, hear this word I'll read the verse again 1 Corinthians 3 3 for ye are yet carnal for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions are ye not carnal and walk as men you see envy and strife lead to divisions they lead to separations and that's not heavenly wisdom that's not pure wisdom that's polluted wisdom that generates that kind of thing I'm reminded of a man that was, boy, I've got to move. I'm reminded of a man that was saved late in his years in, uh, in the church in, in uh, um, Sunshine. He was saved in his late 60s after he'd retired. He'd lived a professional life. He was a, a high flyer, very successful. And in the world and as a high flyer in corporate and all that sort of stuff, it's all about self-promotion it's all about strife it's all about moving up the rungs on the ladder and and to do that you have to tread on people and you have to bring people down and and you know he had a lot of lot of and we all do but he had a lot of baggage to work through after he was saved and he was starting to try and apply that kind of thinking and that kind of wisdom in the church in his relationships and he was always striving to to be noticed and to be promoted and to be number one and and, and it caused so much trouble in his heart and his mind and, and in the family at large as a church. And, and he, he eventually, after a number of years of patience, he, he recognised that himself, that that's what he was doing. He was trying to bring down other people so he could move up. That, that's strife and that's earthly. That's sensual, that's devilish. He said, uh, glory not, in verse 14, glory not. Don't boast about that kind of wisdom. Don't boast about that kind of behaviour. You ought to be ashamed of that kind of wisdom. You ought to be repentive of that kind of wisdom. Don't be boasting about it. And don't lie about it either. And Lie not against the truth. Don't try and make it out to be something that it's not. Jump down to verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Uh, this polluted wisdom, when applied, uh, where envy and strife is present, the end result of that is confusion. And confusion, it doesn't mean necessarily, it, it does mean this, but it means more. Than, it doesn't just mean, oh, I don't know what's going on. It, it has the idea of creates instability and it creates disorder and commotion. It's confusion. And we know that God is not the author of confusion. He's not the author of commotion. He's not the author of disorder. He's not the author of instability. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of, in complete contrast to confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And so the origin of this polluted wisdom it's not from above, it's earthly, sensual, devilish. The outworkings of it is strife, envy, confusion. Division, instability, commotion, 
And you can see that, whether it be in your marriage relationship, in your family relationship, in a church relationship or a, ch or a business setting. You can be sure, you can write it down. If, if, if after you've done doing your thing and approaching it your way, and at the end it's not peace, it's confusion, you've no doubt applied polluted wisdom rather than pure wisdom to that situation. If I, if I approach uh, a, a conflict, if I approach a disagreement, and after I've been involved, I've perhaps injected myself into that or I'm a part of it, and we come out of there with strife, envy, commotion, confusion, no doubt that there's been earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom applied, not pure wisdom. We're all guilty of it. Let's notice, secondly, let's notice pure wisdom. In contrast, let's go to something positive. Pure wisdom. Uh, I'd like to read, um, I'll read the last portion of verse 13, and then I'll come down to verse 17 and 18. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. That's what I want you to see, meekness of wisdom. Uh, verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without, hypocr without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The origin of this pure religion, this pure wisdom. But the wisdom that is from above. We need to apply James chapter 1 and verse 17. Again, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Where's this pure wisdom come from? It's come from heaven. It's come from the Father of lights. And because it's come from him, we know it's good and we know it's perfect. The origin. You know, the source of something is always very important. Uh, quite often when you are criticised or when an allegation is levelled against you, it's always very important to consider the source. Because some allegations and some, uh, what was the other word I used? Allegations and criticisms. Some criticisms and some allegations come from a polluted source. And you need to be really careful that you consider the source. If it comes from a good source, you better consider what's been said. But if it's come from a polluted source, you better be careful. You better consider it really carefully and weigh it out. The source of this wisdom, the, the origin is, is heaven. Praise God for that. Notice the outworking of this pure wisdom. Verse 13, meekness of wisdom. Wisdom that's from heaven, pure wisdom, heavenly wisdom, uh, applies meekness. Meekness is controlled strength. It's mildness, humility, lowliness. It's free from arrogance, free from self-promotion, free from self-defense, and free from self-interest. Meekness is free of self. Heavenly wisdom, pure wisdom, abandons self. Self is earthly, sensual, devilish. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness. Moses was meek. He was the meekness, the most meekest man that ever walked the earth apart from Jesus. He was a meek man, but he was a man. I mean, you look at what he did. He looked Pharaoh in the eye on more, way, more times than once. 
after they worshipped the golden calf. He was meek, but somehow he made all of them, give them their jewellery and all the gold, and he pounded it up, grinded it into powder, and then he made them drink it. Yet he was meek. Meek isn't what this world would have you believe meekness to be. Whenever they, you know, whenever this world or Hollywood try and picture a godly man, he's always so soft and feminine and always crying and uh, man up. Yeah, have, you, have you ever noticed that in Christian novels or Christian movies? You know, the the the, the really godly husband, he's, he's always such a pansy. No, we don't have to be rough. We don't have to be rude and crass and all the rest of it as godly men. But meekness isn't about weakness. No, meekness is just free of self. And godly wisdom, this pure wisdom, is free of self. Not only is it uh, meek, but notice verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. The word pure means chaste, clean, innocent, without spot. I want to say it's free. On every one of these, I'm going to say the opposite. It's free from certain things as I define them. Pure is chaste, clean, innocent, without spot. Free from ethical, moral, legal corruption. The wisdom that is from above, is, it's pure wisdom. And it's free from that which corrupts. It's free from ethical, moral and legal corruption. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22 Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Heavenly wisdom is not only pure in itself and keeps you pure, but then interacts in a pure manner, free from legal, moral and ethical corruption and pollution. And whenever something questionably ethical, moral or legally is done, it didn't come from pure wisdom because pure wisdom is pure. How about that? Thirdly, the outworking of this pure wisdom is it's peaceable. The word peaceable is quiet, undisturbed, not agitated with passion. You see someone getting all worked up and in a flat, running around with their, like a chook with its head cut off. No, no, that's not heavenly wisdom. That's probably sensual wisdom. It's probably, because it's not rationalism probably, necessarily. It may not be devilish, but it's certainly been generated by your emotions and your passions. Peaceable. It's free from strife, free from war, free from commotion. It's quiet and undisturbed. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's gentle. The outworking is gentle. The word gentle means mild moderate, patient, soft, soothing. It's free from roughness, free from harshness, free from severity. If you go into a situation harshly, you go into a situation with severity and with roughness in your speech or a, a rough persona, that's not, that's not heavenly wisdom. Paul said to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. As a nurse feeds a child upon her breast, as she's, she's, she's gentle with that baby, as she gently nurses the baby. It's a gentle thing. 
It's not severe. There's no harshness in that. It's, a, it's gently done. And Paul said, he, he said, we've interacted with you as gently as a woman nursing a child. What an incredible statement. Gentleness. But that's what pure wisdom is. That's what heavenly wisdom is. is it's gentle. It's easy to be entreated. The word easy to be entreated means compliant, easily persuaded, to be approachable and agreeable, free from debate, free from argument. It's someone that is easy to deal with. Have you ever, have you ever been um, uh, inclined to speak with somebody and you're like, I just don't know if I want to. It's just such hard work. I just I feel like they're going to jump on me. I just don't know how they're going to respond. That's not being easily entreatable. Someone that's easily entreated is somebody that is easily approachable. They have an, a, an agreeability about them. It's not that they're just going to tell you everything you want to hear, but they're willing to listen. And when they do respond, they respond with a kindness and a gentleness. That's heavenly wisdom. Easy to be entreated. Good con. Oh, I'm going to. I'm so running out of time. Good thing, brother John, you, I'm, you, you're in here, and so I can just keep going. Yeah. A good, good example of someone that w- was not easy to be entreated was a man by the name of Nabal uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verse 3. Now the name of the man was Nabal and the name of his wife, Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings and he was of the house of Caleb. That word churlish is the complete opposite of easy to be entreated. Uh, The next outworking of this pure wisdom is full of mercy, compassion, pity, benevolence, goodwill, free from demanding justice, free from looking for malice, free from meanness, free from unkindness. Matthew 5 and verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Full of good fruits, Good fruits is fruits is what is something that is produced. It literally means uh, that which can be picked or that which can be pinched. And that's what we do with fruit, isn't it? We see a nice tree and we pinch some fruit off of it and we pick the fruit off it, we pinch it, we, we, we pick it. Godly wisdom will produce good works, or in this instance, good fruits, which others will be able to pick and enjoy as you interact with them in life. As, as people are around you and interacting with you, they can just pick some good fruit, some easy to be entreated, some meekness, some purity, some peaceableness. and They're all the good fruits that this pure wisdom produces and, and people are able to take partake of those good fruits that you produce. They're able to pick them and taste them and enjoy them as they interact with you. If you're employing pure wisdom. Now, if you're employing polluted wisdom, they're going to get an acrid taste. They're going to get a bitter taste. It's like, oh, that's not very pleasant. I don't think I'll eat that again. Right? There's a difference, isn't there? Full of good fruits. Philippians 1 and verse 11 says, Being filled with good fruits of righteousness. That's what we ought to be. We ought to be filled with good fruits of righteousness. Without partiality. Without partiality is without favour. It's to be impartial. Without partiality is to be impartial. Without favour and without bias. Partiality springs from the will and affections rather than from a love of truth and justice and therefore is apt to warp the judgment. If you're, if you're partial, if you have bias, if you have favour, 
with different people, whether it be in church, or family, or work. You need to be careful about decisions and interactions because you, you may be making decisions and you may be making interactions, having interactions with people based on partiality. That's, that's not pure wisdom. That's earthly, sensual, devilish. No, we ought to be completely impartial if we're applying biblical wisdom. 1 Timothy 5.21, I charge thee therefore uh, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, do nothing by partiality. And then the last outworking is without hypocrisy. Sincere, unfeigned, real. Hypocrisy is pretending to be what you're not. It's just assuming a false religion, a false appearance in religion or character or morals. And we, we know what hypocrisy is. In, in, in the old days, before, uh, you know, back in way, way back, um, they, would, they would use different face masks and the, the one actor could play three or four different roles and it's just by being a hypocrite, by taking the mask and putting different masks on, pretending to be different individuals. Don't be that way in life. Just be real all the way down. Matthew 23 and verse 27 says, Woe well, unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and, and of all uncleanness. The Pharisees were hypocrites because they dressed up the outside, but inward they were full of filth. That's been a hypocrite. That's pretending to be, that's taking upon the form of something that you're not. Oh boy. Verse 18, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Uh, the fruit of righteousness is all the above virtues. Pure religion uh, and it's sown in peace of them that make peace. I'm just sort of rushing over this now because I'm already over. Proverbs uh, 3.17, Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. Matthew 5.9, Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of peace. When you're applying godly pure wisdom, peace will follow your way. Pure religion will only be embraced and maintained by employing pure wisdom that in turn produces pure works. Let me give you this one verse, I'm done. Psalm 90 and verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Amen. We'll be dismissed. Just, no, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. What do you say? We'll be dismissed. <laughs> Might start a couple minutes after 11, but should be good. Let's do that.